I'm Tamara, and this is TELUS Talks with Tamara Taggart. We're bringing together experts, thinkers, and leaders, busting myths, sharing stories, and staying connected when Canadians need it the most. We're having unexpected conversations for unprecedented times. Hi, everyone. Today, we are with journalist and author Eva Holland, who is joining us from Whitehorse. Hi, Eva. How are you? Hi, uh, I'm uh, I'm okay. That question feels loaded these days. <laughs> I know it really does. But listen, you you have written your first book, and I mean, this is amazing. Not a lot of people get to say that that they've written a book. Um, your book is called Nerve: A Personal Journey Through the Science of Fear. How did this come about? Why did you want to write this book about fear? Sure. So three things happened kind of in a row. Uh, the first and most important is that my mom died suddenly in the summer of 2015. And my mom had lost both her parents when she was quite young. So I had grown up uh, knowing that she was an orphan and understanding that, you know, she had had a lot of harm from those losses that was sort of ongoing that, that, uh, that lingered. Um, and so I started, you know, eventually to, to fear the idea of losing my parents and my mom in particular, and, and to fear that the harm that I sort of assumed would follow. And, uh, so when she did then die quite suddenly, uh, it was basically my worst fear coming true. Um, but I, you know, after a few months of pretty acute grief, I, I came through, it was clear that I was through the worst of it and I was, I was sad and I missed my mom, but I was going to be okay. I wasn't going to be harmed in the ways that she had been, um, for various reasons. You know, I was older than she was. It's not the 1960s anymore. We've got better understandings, you know, of how to, how to handle grief. Um, I didn't, you know, she had been shipped off to a series of boarding schools, all sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. and so there was something empowering in that to realize that I had faced my worst fear and survived. And, um, meanwhile, I had been dealing with this ongoing fear of heights and, uh, a more newly acquired fear of winter driving as a result of a series of car accidents. Mm. Um, and so after, my mom died in July, 2015. In February, 2016, I had a, the worst panic attack I've ever had from Heights. Um, and that's the incident that starts the book. And then two months after that, I had the last in this series of car accidents. And I said, okay, enough is enough. It, you know, this, uh, these problems need to be dealt with and you, you can, you can deal with this. You, you dealt with your worst fear. You can face these ones too, and try to figure out what's going on and try to fix it. So, Do we have to confront our fears? You don't have to. No, I think it's um, I think it's a decision you make based on the extent to which your fears are interfering with your life or the way you want to mm. live your life. It's um, because doing this work is hard and painful. So it's a matter mm. of if the pain of facing your fears outweighs the pain of of living with them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't think I could jump out of a plane ever. And nor do I want to or feel that I need to, you know what I mean, to do that. But that's something that you felt like you needed to. I mean, I just can't imagine that you I, I can't imagine how hard that would be when you have such a fear of heights to do something like that. Yeah, it was uh, it was not a good day. <laughs> No. I, um, so can you, t can you tell me a little bit about that day? Sure. So I decided, um, since my fear of heights is very particular, it's about a fear of falling as much as it is a fear of heights. I'm okay in airplanes. I'm okay on, in elevators, on bridges generally, as long as it feels sturdy. Um, it's all about my sense of exposure and so I decided the the most dramatic way to try to show myself that I had nothing to be afraid of as far as heights and falling and falling rapidly from heights uh, was to go skydiving. Um, I was supposed to have a friend with me, but she didn't end up being able to go. So I was just by myself at this airstrip oh waiting for hours. To go up and, um, you know, often the the lead up is is as bad or worse than the the event itself. I was just a, a complete wreck. Um, and they really, the skydiving company, they loved it so much and they really believed I was going to be converted. They were like, you're just, you're going to fall in love with this, you know? And I was like, I'm not going to fall in love with this. It's not how it's going to go. Um, and, but I, I did it. I didn't, 
it was a tandem dive. So I wouldn't say I actually participated in the exit from the airplane so much as I just kind of went limp and, uh, and let her <laughs> kind of drag me out of the plane. <laughs> but that was the best well, thing. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's participating as far as I'm concerned. That's a uh, more than I could do. Why do we feel fear? We feel fear, uh, to stay alive. We feel fear, um, to let us fear is, is, is a warning that, that our, our senses have perceived some kind of perceived some kind of threat to our safety. So, uh, fear is, fear is an alarm system essentially. Yeah. It's protecting us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have phobias that, I mean, do they come from somewhere? Like if I have a fear of spiders, but I have no idea why I have a, a fear of spiders. Do phobias, where do they come from? It's not fully understood where phobias come from. There are various theories. And my suspicion is that there's no kind of one right answer, that there's various causes for phobias, maybe even within one individual and certainly across various individuals. So one theory is that it's it's evolutionary that these the, the the classic specific phobias are sort of vestigial uh, fears from when we were sort of hunter gatherer types and and things like spiders, snakes, the dark enclosed spaces, cliff edges were very dangerous. They're, those things can still can be dangerous, but they're not really a day to day threat in our lives in the same way that they would have been. That's one theory. Another theory is that it's genetic. Um, Inter, interspersed with the genetic idea is the idea that it's inherited through behavior rather than through genes. So from the people around you, um, there's some thought still that, that it might be about some kind of negative childhood experience being, being frightened when you're young. Um, but you may never have been scared by a spider when you're, when you're young, you know, most people who are afraid of sharks have never seen one. <laughs> mm. um, so it's, it's tricky to tease out where they, where they come from, but, uh, but they know probably that we are more likely to have them if we have an overall more sort of anxious or inhibited personality. Um, right. It seems that makes be, sense. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be kind of, um, an overreaction of our, of our sort of fear and anxiety drive, uh, mm. like a, like a natural alarm system. That's a little too finely tuned or a little too sensitive maybe, or sort of running amok a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I mean, I, it, because we just talked about how fear, you know, is it protects us at times. Um, like, should we, do we need to look for a cure? Is there a cure for fear? Is there, you know, is there a better way to feel afraid? A, a healthier way? Yeah, I think there's no one cure. There are, there are ways to manage your sort of excessive or irrational fear. There are ways to learn not to overreact to, uh, to threats or to things that may not be threats at all. Um, and in terms of a better way to feel afraid, I think it's about learning to sort of better tune that alarm system to mm. have it go off when it should and not when it shouldn't, which is, which is trickier than it sounds. Um, you know, some of us underreact to threats and some of us overreact and uh, I was an overreactor. And so a lot of the book is about me trying to learn not to overreact anymore, but still to learn how to trust that alarm system after years of saying to, to myself, you know, don't listen, don't listen, push through, um, we do actually need to listen to our fear as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because you, you investigated whether there are right ways or wrong ways to, to face our fears, right? What would be some wrong ways I to mean, face I think, our fears? I think skydiving is not a great way to face it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was not the doctor recommended approach for sure. Uh, I don't think it did me any lasting harm, but it didn't help. Um, and, and, and there can be facing your fears the wrong way can result in harm, particularly mm. uh, with issues like trauma. Um, you can exacerbate your, your PTSD reactions uh, by facing your fears in the wrong way, by, by re-traumatizing yourself, exposing yourself too abruptly or um, without support networks in place, that kind of thing. So it, it, uh, it's not just a matter of like face your fears and, and everything will, will shake out okay. It, uh, mm. it does require some some care and some expertise, and uh, right because some people have fear that is absolutely debilitating, like they can't leave their house. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so, yeah, it's very, um, there's quite a spectrum when it comes to fear. So with this, you know, we're in a worldwide pandemic. Um, there's a lot of fear around COVID-19. Yeah. Um, fear that, you know, you'll get it and die fear that somebody you love will fear of catching it. If you leave your house, uh, all kinds of fears. How have, um, and so you, the, the release of your book is very timely, right? When uh, talking about fear and now we see the world, um, you know, how, how much fear there is around this virus. So, I mean, what's your perspective on, on this climate we're in right now with COVID-19? Yeah, of course, none of this is ever anything I could have imagined when I was working on the book, but I, I hope that there are aspects of the book that are relevant for people or, or useful or helpful in some way. Um, I think it's an interesting time for us all to get sort of better acquainted with our fear if, if a lot of mm. people aren't, aren't used to this kind of anxiety. You know, Some people live with this kind of anxiety all the time, but um, for a lot of people, the pandemic represents a, a new relationship to fear and anxiety. And um, I guess I would say, you know, I hope that they understand that those feelings are natural all the time, uh, but especially now. Um, and then, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of if you're finding yourself waking up in the night with your heart racing, thinking about, you know, your relatives in care homes or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh it's natural and it's, it's your body trying to find its way through this threat that that's not the kind of threat that it's easy for us to get a grip on and respond to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how are, how are things in Whitehorse with, with, um, with the virus? And, and I mean, you know, it's, it's, I think it's very different in every city. And, and um, I know when I drive uh, around Vancouver, which I don't do very often, I have barely left the house, but it's, it's really um, strange to see things boarded up on, on big busy streets and nobody around. And how are things for you up there? Things here are pretty good. You know, when it first was kind of spreading through North America, people here were pretty scared. Um, we have, fairly limited medical infrastructure in the North, of course. So the big, the big fear was that it wouldn't take much of an outbreak here to really overrun our resources. We, t we already tend to medevac most of our serious medical issues to, to Edmonton or Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the nightmare scenario for us was if you guys were overrun and we were overrun, there'd just be, be nothing to do and, and nowhere to go. The number that I heard is that we have had four ICU beds here in the whole territory. Um, right. I'm not certain if that uh, that's accurate, but it's, it sounds about right. We typically, uh, you know, acute cases just get medevaced. So, but we seem to have acted in time. We we had 11 cases here confirmed, um, all connected to travel outside the territory, and they've all recovered. Um, so we currently have zero cases, and we've sort of closed our borders more or less. Um, right. Um, hoping to to keep it at, at bay that way, you know, for more isolated communities, it seems like the best defense is just more isolation. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it seems like you know when it comes to uh, this pandemic, if fear is a good thing, you, you, do you know what I mean? Like it, it is protecting us. Like if so, we do stay home and we we are more aware of our surroundings and touching our face. You know what I mean? It's, it's made us so aware of so many things that we weren't, um, even thinking about before, you know? Uh, I mean, even, even wearing a mask out in public, right? When I wore a mask out to go, uh, get some groceries, I felt very strange. Like it was not normal for me to be doing this, but my fear, I guess, is protecting me and telling me to put that on. Would you agree with that or? Absolutely. Yeah. This is a perfect example of a time when it's, it's good to listen to our fear to an, to an extent, at least, you know, that's what's, mm. that's, what's driving everyone following these incredible guidelines that none of us have ever had to tolerate before is, is fear for ourselves, fear for others, fear for our community. I think the limit is you don't want to listen to your fear to the extent that you can't even, you know, let's say you're healthy, your family's healthy and you have a neighbor who can't go get their own groceries. Like you don't want your fear to limit you to the point where you can't help that neighbor. Um, 
but you want your fear to keep you in check, to keep you from throwing a barbecue or, or, uh, you know, um, that, that kind of thing. Right. Are, are there people who don't feel fear ever? There are a very small number that we know of. Yeah. Um, there's one woman in particular who's known to scientists as patient SM and she has a very rare genetic disease that, uh, infiltrated her brain and destroyed her amygdala, which is the brain structure that basically assesses our, our, our threat data. It, it takes the incoming data from our, from our senses and says, okay, that's a threat and triggers the fear response. So because she doesn't have an amygdala, she appears to be incapable of, of sensing threats and responding to them. So she has basically no sense of self-preservation whatsoever. It's actually, you know, it sounds cool. Like she's literally fearless. No, I don't think it does sound it. It sounds very dangerous for her. It is extremely dangerous. She's very lucky to still be alive. Um, A scientist years ago removed the amygdalas from a group of monkeys and released them back into the wild. And they were all dead in two weeks. My goodness. I had no idea. So we do, pa- we can pass on fear. We Absolutely. can pass it on. So, I mean, I guess my question is, is fear contagious? Can I pass a fear that I don't even know that I may have onto my children? That gets into the territory where they're not totally certain. Certainly, if you have a fear that you act on in front of your children, they're, they're more likely to pick it up. If, if they see you reacting with fear to spiders, let's say, they're more likely to take that as a cue to also react with fear to spiders. Um, if you had fears that you didn't even know about that never sort of came to the surface, um, mm-hmm. that's trickier. You do, they, they do know that if you, if you were somebody who had a lot of fear and anxiety, even if you didn't act on it in front of your children, they'd be more likely genetically to potentially also have fear and anxiety, but it wouldn't necessarily match yours exactly. Like they might have a different right. phobia. Um, so that's, there's passing on kind of an inclination and then there's literally passing on the specific fear and, and the one seems to be driven more by behavior or the latter. Mm. What, what takeaways do you want, uh, people to have from your book? What do you want them to know after, or, or what do you hope they get from your book once they read it? I think two things. One is that you don't have to be as driven to face your fears and overcome them as I was. I think that's one thing that I end up wrestling with in the book is like, is it okay to maybe just live with some of this stuff? Um, so they shouldn't feel sort of obliged to, to figure it out and fix it. Um, and the other thing is if they do want to change it, it's much more changeable than I realized. I, by the end of the book, I had made a lot more progress on my fears than I expected to. You know, I sort of I pitched the book expecting to write kind of a mushy epilogue where I'm like, well, I didn't really fix anything, but I learned a lot along the way, you know? Right. But, but I really changed, I really changed my relationship to fear, um, through doing this work. And, and so, you know, not to be like, you can do it too, but, uh, but there is, it's more changeable than we realize. It can feel impossible Mm. to change the way we respond to fear, but, but it's not impossible. Well, that's good to know. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. And again, uh, Eva's new book is called Nerve, Journey Through the Science of Fear. You can buy it anywhere that you buy your books online right now. And also on her website, which is evaholland.com. That's E-V-A holland.com. And be sure to join us here on Telus Talks with Tamara Taggart every Tuesday and Thursday. Thanks so much, Eva. Thank you.